Hello. I thought with it being Easter weekend, everybody being at home with the lockdown, I'd do a, a little Easter devotion just as an encouragement and a reminder of what this season's all about and of all that the Lord has done for us uh, through the death, burial, and resurrection of our wonderful Savior. So what, I, what I'm just going to do this morning is walk through uh, the, the Easter story, if you will, and make some comments along the way and just um, want to be a blessing from God's Word. So we're going to just talk through it. So we'll pray first and then um, look at a bunch of scriptures together. Lord, I pray for your blessings upon this uh, little devotion, and it'll just be an encouragement to all of us, and a reminder of what Jesus did for us, uh, the basis of our salvation, our victory, and uh, Lord, that you'll use your word to be a blessing to hearts now. In Jesus' name we ask this, amen. <clears throat> So just to kind of walk through chronologically, it all started there in the upper room when Jesus was with his disciples and, and uh, encouraging them. And in, in John chapter 17, uh, he prayed for his disciples, uh, but he also then prophesied of what was coming there. In John 17 verse 4, he said, I've glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And so the ministry of Jesus Christ was coming to an end. And now the death on Calvary was coming. But right after that, they, the Bible says they sang a hymn. They went out into the garden of Gethsemane with Peter, James, and John. And um, Jesus went apart from them and began to pray. And over in Luke, if you want to go to Luke chapter 22, we're going to bounce back and forth in the Gospels a little bit. But Luke chapter 22 and verse 44, the Bible tells us that uh, he be, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And so Christ, in his time of prayer, calling out to the Father that if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Um, the Bible says his prayer was so earnest that his sweat was, as it were, uh, blood. And this, this is the beginning of the suffering that he would go through for us. But as we know, in those prayers, he surrendered to the Father's will. And um, right after those prayers, then Judas came with the soldiers who Jesus, of course, betrayed Jesus. And if you want to look over in John 18, something very interesting and very powerful happened uh, there in the garden. It's only recorded in John uh, when the soldiers arrived. Here in John 18, verse 3, it says, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. Can you imagine soldiers, armed soldiers, the uh, Bible says they went backward and fell to the ground. That was just from the power of Christ's spoken word. He was just, again, displaying his amazing power, his deity there by just saying, I am he. Uh, John, of course, being the book of the, of the I am's, and Jesus just in, in saying that phrase, I am he, there was so much power in that that the soldiers fell backward. I uh, can't even imagine what that would have been like. In, in the course of all of that, one of the um, disciples cut off one of the high priest's servant's ear. Uh, it says uh, in Luke chapter 22 that he, Jesus touched his ear and healed him. So he even took the time to heal the servant's ear in the midst of all of, of, of this um, the betrayal. And um, if you go over to Matthew chapter 26... Jesus made it very clear that uh, it wasn't the soldiers that had the power, it wasn't the disciples that had the power, that Jesus was going through this voluntarily. And uh, notice John, uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. Thinkest thou that I, I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? So he said, if I wanted to, I could call down 12 legions of angels to rescue me from you. 
But he said, the scriptures must be fulfilled. I have to go through this, this suffering. So when we talk about the suffering of Christ, and we're going to do that now, we're going to kind of summarize many of the ways in which he suffered for us. Uh, we, we need to understand that that was all part of God's plan, and it was, it was necessary uh, for our salvation. I just want to cut a, quote, quote a couple of scriptures. 1 Peter 3.18, it says, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So Jesus suffered once, but it says the just for the unjust. And then Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it says, In that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. In other words, he can help us. He can understand when we suffer because he's been through it. And then in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus knew that it was, it was going to be horrible and terrible, but afterward would come the joy of the victory. And so back to, to Matthew 26 now, uh, and down in verse 67, we're just going to now kind of summarize some of the suffering that our Savior went through on our behalf. In Matthew 26, verse 67, it said, They did spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? So the suffering began in the Garden of Gethsemane, of course, but now the Bible says that they, they spit on him and they, they punched him and hit them with the palms of their hands. Um, the Bible says over in Luke 22 that they blindfolded him and struck him in the face and asked, saying, Who is he that smote thee? So the suffering begins. And uh, over in Matthew 27 now, after one of the mock trials over in Matthew 27, look down in verse 26. The Bible says, um, yeah, Matthew 27, 26, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So there's not a lot there, and it's easy to just pass over that word scourged. But if you look at Roman history, you'll understand that scourging was horrible. Scourging required a cat of nine tails and leather with bits of glass tied on the end. And, and they would literally whip them with it and rip the flesh off, off of people's backs. And Jesus went through that, that scourging, before all the rest of, of what happened uh, at Calvary. Uh, so in Matthew twenty-seven twenty-eight, it says they stripped him. So they took off his clothes and put on him a scarlet robe, it says. And then down in Matthew 27, 29, it says, And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. And so we're all familiar, but remember, these would have been large thorns, and, and the scalp um, always bleeds a lot. And so they put this crown of thorns on his head, but they went further. Uh, it says in verse 30, And they spit on him and took the reed and smote him on the head. So after putting the crown of thorns on his head, they began to spit and to mock again, but then they began to pound on the top of the crown of thorns uh, with a reed to push the thorns further down into his scalp. The Bible says, um, if you want to look over in Isaiah chapter 50, that through this experience, um, they even ripped out his beard uh, by the roots. And uh, I'm sure we can't even imagine how painful that could be. But in Isaiah 50, verse 6, it says, I gave my back to the smiters, that's talking about his scourging, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So they actually ripped the, his beard out by the roots. While we're in Isaiah, look over in chapter 52, if you would. And down in verse 14, it says, As many were astonished, at the his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men so the bible says that his visage or his his, his appearance of his face was so marred that he didn't even look like a man and so between the punchings between the crown of thorns between ripping the beard out by the roots christ's face was was filled with blood and bruises and and distorted and it says his visage was marred Jesus went through all of that, and, and that's just the beginning, and he did it all for us. Uh, but over in, um, in, in the midst of all of this suffering, we know that then he 
he had another trial there with Pilate, and part of that part of the suffering of Jesus was was the rejection by the Jews, the final rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. If you go over to uh, John 19, it's a very sad uh, prophetic statement by the Jewish people, by the Jewish leaders. Uh, notice John chapter 9, um, verse 14. It, it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. What a thing to say. They had been crying out to God for centuries to be rescued from tyranny, and now most recently Roman tyranny, to have their own country, their own kingdom, and for them to turn around and say, the high priest to Pilate, We have no king but Caesar. How sad. So the Bible says, of course, after this event, then they, they took him up to Calvary and uh, nailed him to a cross. Um, and the Bible says that he, he was going to die on that cross, but of course that was the, the Romans' choice for execution. They made it as painful as possible. Uh, and um, it was all designed to cause pain for as long as possible. <clears throat> and they nailed our Savior to the cross. Now, if you want to go over to Luke chapter 23, uh, some amazing things happened while Jesus was on Calvary, while, while he was up on Mount Calvary, uh, hanging on that cross. And the, the most amazing thing is that right after they mounted him on the cross and put the cross into the ground, in verse 34 of, John, of Luke chapter 23, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So they have just punched him, mocked him, spit on him, put a crown of thorns on his head, slammed it down with a reed, abused him, mistreated him, made him carry the cross as far as he could up to Mount Calvary, nailed him to the cross. And then Jesus says, Father, forgive them. So imagine what what amazing love is coming through at this time. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't realize that they, they are crucifying their own Savior. They're crucifying their own Messiah. Forgive them. And, and so, while, again, here in Luke chapter 23, he was on, on the cross now. We know that the, there was um, thieves on both sides. It says in verse 35, The people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. In other words, they continued to mock Christ while he's hanging there on the cross. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of the Greek and Latin and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost, now, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So Jesus Christ not only forgave the people that crucified him, but even while he's hanging on the cross, one of these thieves said, Lord, please remember me. He acknowledged that he was Lord and he said, remember me. And from, from the hanging on the cross and all the pain and agony and the bleeding and everything he's been through, he says to this thief, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He, he forgave this thief and, and offered him eternity in paradise from the cross. It's amazing. So it, not only that, but if you go to John 19, it, it's just fascinating in the midst of all this pain and suffering, and remember Jesus Christ was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. And th this suffering is real. This pain is real. And yet he's now forgiven them. 
the, the ones who crucified him, he's now uh, offered this thief to be with him in paradise. He even then takes the time here in John 19 to make sure that his his earthly mother is taken care of. Obviously, some time during the course of Christ's ministry, his earthly father, his adoptive father, had died. And it says here in John 19, 25, there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. And so from the cross, Jesus makes sure that John, the apostle, will take care of Jesus' mother after his death and burial and resurrection and ascension. Isn't that beautiful? That, that even makes sure that Mary's taken care of and, and John took that responsibility upon himself. And so... <clears throat> Back to Luke, if we could, uh, chapter 23. So after taking care of his mother and making sure that, um, that her, her needs will be met uh, through John's love and care, then the suffering truly begins here in Luke chapter 23. Look at verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Now we read that one verse, and it's in the other Gospels as well, and it's hard for us to imagine what that really meant. But for, six, for three hours in the middle of the day, the sky went dark. And this was God's way of saying to the earth that Jesus was becoming sin for man, that the perfect righteous Son of God was becoming sin. And the Bible says that, 2 Corinthians 5.21, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became sin. And the Bible says in verse 45, The sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. In other words, the, the thick uh, fabric of the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies and the temple uh, was torn from the top to the bottom. It was God's way of saying to the world, the access to the Holy of Holies will no longer be limited. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I can, can come boldly into the throne of grace, as we're told in Hebrews chapter 4. And how beautiful is that? But during those three hours of darkness, Jesus became sin. If we want to turn uh, back to Matthew 27... In uh, verse 46, we will see that uh, because Jesus became sin for us, and we don't understand how all of this works because God's ways are higher than our ways, as we're told in Isaiah 55, but for those three hours, uh, God the Father had to turn his back on God the Son because God is of pure eyes and to behold evil. And the Son chose to become sin for us because there was no other way for us to be saved. And so in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In his agony of becoming sin, the agony was just increased now by having to be separated, by having to be forsaken, which is what we owe. We all owe to be separated from God for eternity in hell. We all owe to be, to be forsaken because we've broken God's laws and His holiness. But Jesus went through that separation and that forsaking for us and cried out from the cross, Why hast thou forsaken me? And so we go over to John chapter 19. And the Bible tells us that after this three hours of darkness, sin had been paid for. Hallelujah. And um, we're told over in uh, verse John chapter 19, verse 30, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. Man's sin has been paid for. The substitute has paid the price. It is finished. 
And there's so many scriptures we could talk about now, but Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus suffered for us. Romans 5, 8, God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then Hebrews 9, 26, it says, Now once in the end of the world he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 10, 10, By the which will were sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And Hebrews 10, 14, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So Jesus Christ became sin for us, and when he cried it is finished, he meant that, that the price for sin had been paid through what he had endured. And of course, he, the Bible says that then he cried with a loud voice and said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And the Bible says that he gave up the ghost. And so this is the, just a, a small summary of the amazing suffering that our, our Savior went through on our behalf, that he might pay the price of what we owe. And there is no suffering that we can go through that Jesus doesn't understand. And that's very important for us to understand. But what happened afterward is, of course, the resurrection story. What makes Easter such an exciting time is remembering that Jesus did not stay in the grave. Hallelujah. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 1, 4, He's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You know, Paul said, if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain. Just, the resurrection is the cornerstone of our faith. It's the cornerstone of Christianity. And uh, 1 Peter 1, 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's all based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we can have eternal life and we can have the hope of eternity with the Lord in heaven. So let's go to Matthew 28 quickly and just talk quickly about the resurrection and um, why we go to church on Sunday morning. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. So we see the angels came and rolled back the stone from the sepulcher that Jesus had been buried in. And if you want to go over to Mark chapter 16 now, again, we're reminded when Jesus rose from the dead, it was on the morning of the first day of the week. Why? That's why we go to church on Sunday. Every Sunday is a way of saying, Jesus is alive. Jesus arose from the dead. Mark chapter 16, look at verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And it says, And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were affrighted, and he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him, but go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. The angel said, He's not here because he's risen, because he told you this would happen. And then embedded in that little message, go tell his disciples and Peter. Peter, the one who denied him three times. Peter, the one who then wept bitterly. Go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus has arisen from the dead. Go tell Peter as well. And as we know, Peter was restored and became uh, one of the greatest apostles of all time. One of the greatest preachers of all time. And then um, over in chapter 24 of Luke, we'll look at that one quickly as well. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Uh, the Bible says, Upon the first day of the week, 
Very early in the morning they came unto the sepulcher bringing the spices which they prepared and certain others with them and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus and it came to pass as they were much perplexed Thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet w with you in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified in the third day, rise again. And Jesus had told them, but they didn't get it. And it says, and they remembered his words. Now it's making sense what Jesus told us, that he would go to Jerusalem and, and be crucified, and the third day he would rise again. And they're seeing it come to pass. And the Bible tells us that, that uh, he then appeared to Peter. Uh, we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And then Jesus appeared, if you go to John chapter 20, Jesus appeared to his disciples. Where were the disciples? They were hiding out. They had all fled after the Garden of Gethsemane, and they were just hiding. They didn't know what to do. Uh, the one that they had trained them for three and a half years and, and preached with them and taught them was crucified, and they, they just hadn't grasped yet what was, what was happening, that Jesus came back from the dead. And so while they were hiding out, the Bible says he appeared unto them in John chapter 20, look at verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. It's now time for your ministry to go forward. I'm about to leave. And, we, and down in verse 28, uh, remember Thomas had said, Unless I see the prince of the nails in his hand, I will not believe. It, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Thomas recognized, this is Jesus. He's back from the dead. He's my Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me and thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. We don't get to see the body of Jesus Christ with the prints of the nails in his hands. But Jesus pronounced a blessing upon those who haven't seen him physically, but we believe that he did rise from the dead for us. And so if you go to Acts 1, we're almost finished here this morning. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passions by many infallible proofs, being seen to them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus spent forty days with his disciples between his, his resurrection and his ascension. Imagine. It all makes sense to them now. He's back from the dead. They can see the prints of the nails in his hands, and yet he's teaching them all about what's to come. And then after the 40 days, it says, verse 4, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. So he said, I, I, you're not ready for your ministry yet. You need the power of the Holy Ghost. You need the filling of the Holy Ghost. And they were told to wait, which, of course, happened on the day of Pentecost. But when Jesus ascended to heaven, we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once. This would have been right at the ascension of Jesus Christ. 500 people watched Jesus ascend to heaven. Imagine if we could have been one of those 500. And then his last words, very important, verse 8, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Bible says, And when he had spoken these things, Acts chapter 1, verse 9, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as we know, the Bible teaches he's now in heaven interceding for us at the right hand of the throne of God. Sins paid for. We can go to the Holy of Holies. Jesus has paid the price. It is finished. And that's what Easter's all about. That Jesus suffered unbelievable suffering on our behalf and that he died, that he became sin for us on Calvary and that he came back from the dead to prove that he had the power over death so that he can now offer us eternal life. Jesus says in John 10, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. Jesus offers eternal life and to prove he had the power to give it, he conquered death and came back. Gave his disciples the power of the Holy Ghost, which we have as well if we're saved.
that we might, what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and tell them the good news that the creator of the universe became a man. As it says in 1 Timothy 3.16, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus came, died, rose again, ascended to heaven, all of that for us that we might now go tell others what happened. That is the Easter story. And I hope that will be a blessing to you this Easter weekend, 2020. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll see you Sunday morning for Easter. God bless.